Welcome back, everybody, to the Kalispell Warhawk Dynasty on NCAA Football 14. Make sure you've watched the end of Season 11 before getting too far into this video. Well, this is now the longest dynasty I've done on the channel. We are through 11 seasons, and this one ended with a national championship defeat. We have played in four national title games now in the series, this being our fourth in a row, but now we finally met a team that could beat us in this game. And if you look back at some of our big games, and the comebacks we've had, and the wild finish against Penn State in the Rose Bowl, it felt like we were due to eventually have a game like this not go our way. But I really enjoyed the challenge that Florida brought, and I wasn't sure how they'd play being an option team, but I think that this was the most interesting game I've played on NCAA 14 against the team that wants to run an option offense. So much so that I might even take a look at their playbook and edit all the other option teams to that playbook for when we go head-to-head, -head because option teams become very common throughout the series. So let's take a look here at what playbook they are running, in case any of you are curious. They run the Oregon Spread Offense, and I felt it was a really fun game. They definitely switched things up a lot, and they weren't predictable, as many option teams are. And they ran the ball well while giving the ball to their best player in Robert Carroll. They also had to use backup quarterbacks in this game, including RJ Bailey, who is one of their running backs. But I checked his ratings during the game. I'll show them now. He was actually an athlete coming out of high school, and his passing ratings maybe suggest he should be the starting quarterback. Bailey has 84 speed, which is a lot lower than I thought he had, and he has very good acceleration and break tackle. A lot of good ratings here, including 99 spin and juke. This screen doesn't show it, but I will be able to find it over here. His throw power is 85, and his accuracy is 86. So they were prepared with Bailey in the game, but I also thought that their starting quarterback, Raymond Singleton, played really well when he was in the game as well. So Florida proved that they could end our run as champions. And now we're headed into year 12. And the newest season is going to begin at a date to be determined. I am for sure doing year 12. I just have some stuff coming up and I don't want to get into a new season right now. Instead, I want to focus on the start to the Denver Broncos franchise on the channel. And then when things get settled here, I will do an off season and we'll get through at least one more season with this team, maybe more. But there's a lot to look forward to in year 12 with us meeting up with Stanford again, Montreal Bonds at Fresno State, probably going to see some of the other good quarterbacks in our league as we didn't have a great schedule this year. So I think year 12 will be a lot of fun. But here was how our season went, of course. In the beginning, it looked like this might not be a very good year for us. The loss to Minnesota was our most decisive in a very long time. That felt like one of those Stanford matchups where we weren't even close. But Minnesota only went 6-6 six and six despite the really good game against us. And then, I missed my first field goal ever with Rick Thomas to lose against Penn State. That was one of the first times I've seen Ice the Kicker in a while, and I wasn't ready for it. I did think we'd end up with a couple more losses this year, just based on how things began, but once we got into conference play, the offense started to take off, and our defense proved to be way too good. There were not many teams that could put up multiple touchdowns against us, and breaking 20 was something that only happened, it looks like, one time in conference play. And if you look at the win-loss for our opponents, Penn State had 10 wins, UCLA had 8, Oregon had 8. Overall, we didn't really have a challenging schedule, and I do prefer challenging schedules at this stage for more interesting games. We had a lot of blowouts this year as the offense proved they were still really good including in this game right here we had 52 points and this was the austin jenkins game where he broke the single game rushing record 
for Kalispell with 304 yards and three touchdowns. I started to think after his second touchdown that he might have a chance, and I couldn't believe the score he had to end the first half. So we get over 300 in that game, and that was a week after putting up 69 points, I believe the most ever in a single game for Kalispell. Drake Maddox had a couple scores. It was interesting to see his season develop because he is a raw tight end, basically. He doesn't have the best route running. And early in the year, that seemed to actually be an issue. I really couldn't find ways to get him open, which surprised me. But later in the year, things opened up and we saw just how good he can be. Let's take a look at some stats now. Luke Irvin, as a freshman quarterback, finished with 32 touchdowns and 13 interceptions in his first year of starting. I was able to limit the interceptions down the stretch for the most part. It was fun getting to play with a pocket passing quarterback again and uh, have someone with the arm talent of Luke Irvin because he could make some spectacular passes. On the ground, Austin Jenkins broke Roscoe Sheridan's single season rushing record. A lot of that because of the 304 yard performance. But Jenkins ended up 6.2 yards a carry. That 300 yard game, by the way, increased his average by a full yard. He also had 13 touchdowns. Jim Jackson, meanwhile, got some carries, five touchdowns on the year on 356 yards. Sean Merville, he did have some long runs, so he has one of the best averages on the team. Tyrone Houston. I always like to have a receiver that I give jet sweeps to and I try to use in that capacity, and Houston's really good at that. He had three rushing touchdowns this year to go with his nine receiving scores. He led us in receiving touchdowns, I'm pretty sure we'll get there. Matt Reddick. Now, early in the year, I started to use him as kind of a special package quarterback where we'd run some option. After a while, I stopped doing it because I felt our running game was pretty good as it is. And I didn't want to take Irvin off the field because he's such a good passer. And there weren't many games where we struggled, so it made more sense to leave Irvin in there. A few more carries here down the board. I am really surprised that I gave, looks like, 10 carries to Houston, 9 to Edwards, yet the production was so different because I thought Edwards could have this kind of production here on a couple runs a game or here and there, but he only had 19 yards compared to Houston's 193 rushing. Let's go receiving now. It was Drake Maddox who led us in receiving touchdowns after taking off in the second half of the year. I think that if it showed splits for the first half and second half, like he did most of his damage later in the year, ended up with nearly a thousand yards receiving, 10 touchdowns, and all that with only three drops, which I'm pretty sure were early in the season. As we tend to do, though, the ball got spread around to the different receivers. Nick Lindsay, 728 yards, just two touchdowns, including one in the national championship game. He does a very good job as a possession receiver and had no drop passes. Sherrod Edwards, a couple times this year, including in the championship game, we saw his potential on display. I can't wait to see where he'll develop going next. I think that this is a really strong year for him given the ratings and some of the deficiencies in a few areas. So he should have a pretty good sophomore year, I'd have to imagine. And then Tyrone Houston. He was our primary deep threat, did a great job getting open down the field, ended up with 12 total touchdowns, nearly a thousand all-purpose yards. Really liked having him as the number one option. And then past production here with Austin Jenkins. He's always done this part very well. 344 yards, two scores there. Colt Sully, always fun to get him on the field because of his high spec catch rating at 98. And it seems whenever he's on the field, he's able to make something happen. And we'll see if those opportunities increase, but we're not losing anybody to graduation or anything. A few more catches here down the list. Not a whole lot, though, outside of our main starters. Let's go blocking here. Johnny Cabral gave up nine sacks. I was actually pretty disappointed in Sylvester Rosthorn's freshman year. He gave up eight sacks on the season, and a lot of them, when I was commentating the games and editing, really stood out. 
I felt like he wasn't as consistent as I expected. He has 88 pass blocks, so I expected better. But he's only a freshman. We'll see what happens going forward. Also, our guards had their fair share of issues. They're definitely better run blockers, and that's part of why Austin Jenkins was able to set records this season. But given no one's a senior, unless someone decides to transfer, the offensive line should all get better. The receiving core should all get better. Quarterback, running back, tight end. We're not losing anything there. But still, it always feels like this is a defensive football team. And there was only one team they really, I guess two teams, they really couldn't solve this year. Early on, Minnesota in their ground game proved to be too much. And then Florida. They just were too good at too many things. And we were reeling for much of the game. And unfortunately, that's how our season comes to an end. But I really like this defense. James Huggins, one of the difference makers at middle linebacker. Over 100 tackles, 18 tackles for loss, two sacks. Part of me wonders if he would try to declare early, but given his 87 overall, I doubt it. I don't think I've seen someone at that low of overall declare early. But his production and skill set, I'd say, would be that of someone who would leave to the draft early. Jamari Akinjide is one of the best players we are going to lose after he graduates and probably gets drafted. He had a really good senior season. Always fun to watch him come down and run defense to make stops. This year, he finally got the interceptions going with five total. He finishes with seven in his career and four touchdowns overall. We're losing both of our starting safeties as Tommy Jordan also graduates. This year was really one of his first chances. Well, I actually had four interceptions a year ago. One this season, seven total. Always fun to have safeties who can cover a lot of ground. It lets me switch up my defensive play calling quite a bit, knowing I have someone with his range. We did a really good job, I thought, of forcing interceptions this year. Three for Brandon Williams, three for Daniel Foster. Another player, I think probably should declare for the draft but I'm not sure he will 92 overall not sure if that would happen but I think it's possible didn't have eight interceptions again but now 13 in his career we'll see if Foster returns for a senior season if he declares I think that really changes the outlook for our defense a year from now but we did a really good job getting turnovers this year very happy to see how many interceptions but we did get worse at pass rush. Shannon Somerville kind of had a sophomore slump, especially early in the year. After 10 sacks as a freshman, just six in his sophomore campaign. He did spend a good portion of the middle of the year only playing situationally as I tried to figure out who could make an impact. There was one game where Trey Walker had three sacks. Those were the only three he had on the season. Eric Bryant had four. Hurst and Cunningham, they each had six. So no one really stood out this year. Hopefully that changes. There's certainly enough talent on this team to where I think somebody can get back to double digits a year from now. Juno Springs, nine pass deflections, just one interception. He had a lot of chances. He's about to graduate after a five interception career, and I really enjoyed having him on the team. I would compare his skill set to Antoine Winfield, undersized corner who can cover well and tackle at the same time. So I'm going to miss him. We're losing some secondary talent. The main question is how much. For sure, three starters. Possibly four, depending on what Foster decides to do. Three forced fumbles for James Huggins, two for Somerville, two for Cunningham, and no safeties this year, but we had four defensive scores. And then let's go special teams. Two missed kicks, only two in the career of Rick Thomas, and they were back to back. I usually don't have an issue with the kicks, but the ice the kicker one did and then I forget the next one. I think it was an overcorrection trying to hit a long kick. Maybe it was an undercorrection. I can't remember. But he finishes his career making like 99% of his field goals at least. We punted about three times a game with Dominic Day. He doesn't have a strong leg. 
he might punt for us next year. We'll have to see. I want to know if his ratings will go up much from 60 overall. Colt Sully, one kick return for a touchdown and 7.6 yards per return there. Let's go career stats now. I like doing this. Although we have such a young team, there probably aren't that many large numbers here. Like Irvin's a freshman, so we saw every career stat this year. And then rushing Austin Jenkins. He's played a couple years as a backup. So now the big breakout, 1,500 plus. Receiving, no one even at 1,000 yards total yet. We're just way too young on offense for standouts there. And then defensively, we'll have some numbers here. Obviously, almost 300 tackles for Jamari Akinjide. Huggins closing in on 200. Akinjide, 36 tackles for loss, playing safety. For sacks, Somerville, 16 in his career. 13 picks for Foster in his three years. How about defensive touchdowns? Actually, forced fumbles. Four for Huggins. And four touchdowns total for Akinjide. Three for Springs. Oh, wow. Thomas attempted 99 field goals in his career. Only missing two, so 97% made. How about returning? Nothing too interesting there. All right, let's go with the season stats then and the career stats around our league. And you'll notice in my Denver Broncos franchise, I'm going to be including some players from this series. I'm going in chronological order with the classes. And the first year of the Broncos series, we'll have some players from the year eight team and a couple players on other teams. So it would take a while for us to catch up to where we're at currently, but that's part of why I make these videos here because they're kind of a time capsule for that season and when I want to go back to check on a stat or a rating or two this is a really convenient way to do it plus it also just gives us a nice way to wrap up the year and talk about it I'm actually really disappointed we never got to play Tyson Walker in his career and I was looking at like the QB1 feature on Madden 20 and Oklahoma is one of the few teams that's in there. It would have been fun to have actually seen him play before and then maybe do the QB1, just a short thing with Walker. I might, when the time comes, put him in the draft class anyway. Tyson Walker was the highest rated quarterback this season. Jason Murray, he also could be a QB1 option. I don't think I'll actually get to the mode now but it's something I thought about a few weeks ago. Most touchdowns, Kevin Lake and Brennan Cummings. A lot of these players we've never seen before, but it's still fun to uh, check this out. 25 interceptions here led Marcus Hill. Ramon Ross, I think we helped out a little bit with his 19. 2,000 plus yards for Robert Carroll. That was a tough game against the best back in the game. And there are a lot of good ones. Jarrell Sanders wins the Heisman Award at 87 overall, 1,800 yards. And thanks to the breakout late, I actually finished quite high with Austin Jenkins, and I normally don't come close. Receiving is always fun to check out as well. 1,300 yards for Zach Lee from Western Kentucky. Not a ton of big schools represented here with the top producers. Freddie Brantley, he must have won the Bletnikoff Award. 16 touchdowns, 1,200 plus yards. I think when I look at the upcoming schedule options, I want to refer back to this to maybe find some of those star players we can eventually play against. I like doing that. And we'll go to defense now. 12 sacks for Dan Parker from Kentucky. Mark Hines, 10 and a half. We'll not see him again as he's a senior. Eight interceptions for Chase Quinn, a 78 overall corner. That's why I like checking these stats because there are a lot of surprises, both in this game and in Madden. So it's fun to see who ends up standing out. Six forced fumbles, wow. How about touchdowns? Two. Joaquin Ferreira. We'll see him next year. Not sure I've done this before. Let's go to NCAA career all-time leaders. This might be useful at some point. 
but Tyson Walker ends his career 6,000 plus yards, 77 touchdowns. That's only two years of playing time for him. It's fun to see the numbers for those four year starters. And right now, Jason Murray, he played like, is that even two full years? And he's the second leader? I honestly thought we'd see someone here with like 140 because they played four years for an air raid school or something. That's a little strange. Let's go rushing then. As Robert Carroll, if this were real, he would be the second all-time FBS leader, like career-wise, behind Ron Dane. 3,300 yards is the lead for Dominic Brown and Joey Bryant of UCLA. We played against him. I think he had one or two catches in that game. But there was like a 70-yard touchdown in there, I remember. 13 picks. Foster is an active leader right now, but there's a three-way tie. And then for sacks, 26 and a half for Andre Hadley. So now that year 11 is over, the players that will be graduating we know are Rick Thomas, Tommy Jordan, Jamari Akinjide, Juno Springs. So our top four players are going to be gone. Johnny Cabral, he's one of those players I'm just not sure. Will he try to declare early or not? And remember, I don't try to convince players to stay anymore. Partially, I think it makes it more realistic, but also I like the added challenge there of having to replace players that don't play four years. There's also Brandon Williams, so there's an opening at linebacker, and Jaquan Cunningham. So maybe next year we become more of an offensive team. There's uh, that possibility depending on who we lose, if there are any surprises. But the offense is really not losing anybody. Well, the defense is losing a ton of players. And if Foster goes, if Huggins goes, like, we're probably allowing a lot more points a year from now. But we already scored a ton this season, so I think our offense is going to be really, really good next year. By the way, for anyone interested in ratings, I know I'm interested, so I just wanted to document some of them here. We have Tommy Jordan. And I want to go to a couple other seniors, Jamari Yak and Jide. Of course, um, you can always go back to like the off-season streams, and a lot of this stuff is shown as well. Foster's 99-man coverage can't get any better, so I wonder if he just goes pro. Perhaps when this draft comes around, it'll include Robert Carroll. We saw him and the impact he could bring to a team, so there's him. I think we also have to look at Tyson Walker here. Just wanted to know skill sets here as best I could. Might not be a bad idea to include his top receiver, Cornelius Davis. Pretty good ratings here. Not sure if I would include Jason Murray, but he did have a really good career at USC and we have played against him. So here are his ratings. I remember recruiting Jamie Alexander. I always wanted a safety with his speed, but we did get Elliot Red, so we still have a lot of range potentially there at the position. Alexander ended up getting eight interceptions in his career, not bad. Here are the All-Americans, Jason Murray, Robert Carroll, Jarrell Sanders. I know it said before we had like the most out of anybody, and there's a ton of defenders here, along with Rick Thomas and Colt Sully. Let's go second team. Hey, Drake Maddox, second team All-American. Not bad. That pretty much makes him a guaranteed freshman All-American. Walker is second team. And then a couple offensive linemen. Somerville again. That's a little surprising. And freshman, Edwards, Maddox, Ross Thorne. I don't think Ross Thorne deserved it. Here is all-conference, by the way. Austin Jenkins, first team. A lot of the same All-Americans. Second team. Still no Luke Irvin there. And I guess he wasn't freshman All-American either. I'm not sure if you can be red shirt and then get that. And then award winners. The Maxwell goes to Jason Murray. Walter Camp to Jarrell Sanders. Benarek to Akinjide. He almost won this one too, but it goes to Brandon Wade. Murray again. Sanders again. Boletnikov did indeed go to Freddie Brantley of Western Michigan. 
Mackie to Zach Lee. Not far with Drake Maddox. Could have a second Mackie Award winner on this team eventually. And here are the O-Line Awards. So close to the Lombardi. Best linebacker is James Huggins. I'd have to agree that Thorpe goes to Akinjide, Rosa to Rick Thomas, and Dominic Day did not get the Ray Guy Award. The last thing then is to take a look at our recruiting, and I think we've already gotten some impact talent this year, and I'm really happy with the class and how it is shaping up. But we have Brandon Warren, a guard, now coming to the team next year, a 73 overall. We don't need to replace any starters this year, so expect him and any other linemen to be red-shirted. But really solid ratings here across the board. Definitely a good ceiling for him. Stan Carter might be the best player in this class, though. If we lose Daniel Foster, I think we have some really good corner talent coming into this team. Carter, 94 speed. He can press. He can play man and zone. And I think he has a chance to play very early with Springs graduating and us needing to find some new players out there. We have a couple DNs here in Mark Kale Ingram and Jeremiah Bolden. There's also Eugene Barber, a few ahead. But Ingram needs a little development here, but he's pretty well-rounded, high agility, good finesse rush. While Bolden has worse agility, worse strength. He'll need a bit more time to develop but they were just some of the easier players, I guess, to recruit. That's part of why we ended up with so many. Eric Richards here at tackle. 72 overall, better run blocker than pass. Barber at 70 overall. Probably won't see the field for quite some time in this series. Now we did get a junior college transfer at punter, Alex Greer. Now he could take over for Dominic Day next year. He has 71 power, 75 accuracy we also have a 76 overall receiver coming to the team but i felt like his overall rating was a little overrated he only has 84 speed and 60 route running so it might be a struggle to get him open he does have 80 catching he was a gem at plus seven overall but I still think that even though he's 76 overall, he needs a lot of development because his weaknesses are in a couple key areas. We'll have a brand new kicker next year in Brandon Hammond, and he'll have 89 kick power right away, so I'm pretty confident he can step in nicely. And I'll save maybe the best for last. Brett Carter, at outside linebacker, he'll step into a starting competition. He has 78 speed. He has decent tackle ratings, might be able to rush the passer a little bit. Skill set reminds me somewhat of Mario Townsend's. And then, 80 overall, Dehonte Jeffries. He's very likely a starter next season, and we won this battle earlier than I had expected. Speed and man coverage are both a plus, so he fits in nicely with Daniel Foster and the way I like to run this defense. Really excited to continue having top-tier defensive back talent on this team. And I'll see who else I can add now as we get into the offseason. Basically, there are a few targets here atop the board. There's Phoenix Chambers, Jed Cartwright, Jared Mills, Derek Jackson. So we have three receivers here at the very top as I got locked out of so many of these. So I'm probably going to spend a lot of these points on the receivers. I'll have to decide who's getting the most points. Phoenix Chambers is a five star though, ranked the number one receiver in the class. Amazing speed and route running. I definitely have to make him a priority. And then Jared Mills, a little bit slower, still a good route runner, but I think that if we could get both, that would be incredible. We're already very likely to get Derek Jackson, so a lot of receiving talent coming in. Good speed, good route running. So we're going to have a lot of competition there for snaps eventually. But that is what the offseason looks like. I don't think it'll be the most interesting recruiting because we're going to be able to put so many points into just a few players, which is always fun because it's a little easier. 
Overall, though, we're only losing nine players to graduation. Uh, I think there could at least be one surprise transfer or early declare. And we'll see if that's the case. Overall, our outlook is still looking very good. We might have a little retooling to do next year on defense. But for now, we are still one of the top teams to beat in the Pac-12 and in the nation overall. So that, everybody, is the end to year 11 of Kalispell football. Again, I'm not quite sure when year 12 is going to get going. I'm hoping here in the next couple weeks, but I will let you know when I know myself, and then we'll get to a brand new year of Kalispell football. Thank you all for your support in this long-running series. It's been really fun. Please leave a like and subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all next time. Have a great day.